Good. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our hospitable masterclass. I am very, very excited to see so many people joining us from all over the world. My name is Simona, and I'm Hospitable's community manager. I am originally from Bulgaria, based in Vienna. And today I will have the pleasure to kick this off and uh, give you a few words about our guest speaker, Leo, and also give you a quick run of show. So today we're happy to have Leo Walton, co-founder and VP of growth at Superhawk, join us uh, together with Matthew, our amazing VP customers who moderate the event. And Matt will tell you a little bit more about Leo later, but um, first I need to mention a few important things. Just a second before I share my screen so you can see this beautiful slide that we prepared. <laughs> Thanks, Simona. All right. So first of all, this masterclass is being recorded and will be made available uh, for playback on our hospitable YouTube channel. So uh, don't worry if you miss a part or you cannot stay for the whole uh, webinar, we'll make sure you get a, a copy of the recording. We'll send you a link uh, tomorrow in an email. So everything is good there. Um, we are very happy to have an engaged audience. So please feel free to ask your questions and leave them in the Q&A section below in the Zoom navigation bar. You can also upvote the ones that you like and we'll get to them in the Q&A session um, right at the end. We'll have Matthew ask them on stage. And last but not least, uh, make sure to follow us for updates on our social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. And also um, we would appreciate if you post about the event uh, so it can reach more posts. All right, so without further um, ado and taking time, I give it to Mario who will um, tell you more a bit a bit more about Leo and uh, the topic tonight. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona. You know, welcome all. Thank you all so very much for joining us here today. As Simona said, my name is Matthew. I'm the VP customers here at Hospitable. I always look forward to hosting these master classes. And tonight, together here with Leo Walton, the co-founder of VP of Growth at Superhard, we're going to share some great information with you all. Leo is a true industry expert, and we're going to talk about trust, more specifically, the value of guest screening and how to strike that right balance between being a good, between having a good guest experience, but also making sure that your place is safe and the security that goes along with it. Um, before we go into the topic, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Leo. So Leo be, it was part of that founding team there at Superhog back in 2019, uh, spent seven years running the supply function over at One Fine Stay, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, those experiences gave him a deep understanding and passion for the vacation rental industry. And in his role today, he's working closely with operators, with hosts, you know, helping them to unlock growth, streamline their operations by using Superhog, which is a great tool that combines guest screening and embedded insurance. So his property management experiences, it really gives him an acute understanding of the pain points that Superhost sets out to solve. Guest screenings, deposits, chargeback property damage. I can already hear Pierre complaining about deposits uh, in the background and telling people, no, no, no. Uh, you know, Leo's passionately committed to building those tools to help improve and revolutionize the industry. Leo loves to run a full-time dad and a, a man you fan. Sorry to hear that about now, but it's early, right? We continue to round. Not that the Portuguese guys got anything to do with it, but we'll leave that at that. Um, so let's get this thing started. You're going to hear lots of useful tips. Be sure to post about the event on social media. Spread the word. Hashtag hospitable. Let's reach as many hosts as we can. Um, Simona, if there's any hashtags or anything to use, throw it in the chat. I see we got a good man you love in the chat as well. I've seen that. I've um, seen that. I'm very happy to see that. Thank you. For the, thank you for the man you reference. We need all the support we can get. So That's for sure at this it. point. Um, oh, and no, just we've got a Liverpool fan. Oh dear, right. Uh, <laughs> I never walk alone. Go, go we on. also will have Brian in the chat. So Brian's part of our sales team here at Hospitable. So if you do have any questions at how that's all going to function and work, feel free you know, to ask Brian some questions. Simone will be there. Um, and as she mentioned, the Q&A for your specific questions that you want to get up on stage, that you want us to ask Leo and have him answer here for you tonight. But the chat is great to just go and talk about MLS football, right? MLS soccer, go Revs. Um, and all that fine stuff. Leo, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, very good. I, it's, I, I'm so honored to be here. You guys are such a great, such a great company. And I'd say I love being uh, associated, associated and partnering with you. So yeah, thank you for including me. And thank you for allowing that very, very kind introduction. Um, I was a very small part of, of the COGS in, in each organization I was in. And I always say, 
as is well said, that it's uh, if you're not the sort of least smart person around the table, then you're at the wrong table. And luckily, I always seem to be at the right table. So I, I love that point of view. I say the same thing. I I, I say that a, a little more crudely, though. I, I plan on being the dumbest person in the room whenever I walk in because then I'm <laughs> good to go. You guys are all going to take care of that for me. Um, so, Leo, let's get started. Right. In the past, I've heard you talk a lot about, you know, having a risk management strategy. And I feel like hosts are really going to be keen to understand a bit more. Can you explain what a risk management strategy means in the context of hosting? Yeah, I can. And I think it's a really interesting question because essentially the industry has changed so much, even since I've been in it, it's changed in 10 years. The, the types of risk change. Like, you know, you're, you're now, when we were younger, we used to go on holiday um, with our family. I used to go on holiday with my family to Devon, which is a place in the south coast of England, very, very beautiful. And we would drive there every year, same cottage, same two weeks. Now, the truth of the matter was the reason we were driving there was because my dad used to be able to expense his petrol. So um, it made for a nice, cheap family holiday. Who doesn't have a who doesn't have a sort of a frugal father amongst us? I'm sure there's many. Um, but what it meant was that every year we got closer with our with our uh, our owner, and every year she would turn up with the key, and we'd chat, and we'd touch base, and talk about how the year had been, and then we'd have our two weeks, and then a day before we left, my parents would be furiously running around with the vacuum cleaner and the duster, trying to make the place clean again, and we left, and. That was the era of brochures and getting ads in magazines to, to get bookings and repeat customers. Because once you found a good cottage that worked for you and your family, you just went back there. I'm not saying all of that has completely stopped, but I'm saying now tech enabled home sharing means that you can take a booking at three o'clock in the morning when you're fast asleep on one of the platforms that you're working on or your own direct, your own direct website. And actually, unless you have tools to mitigate the risks involved with that, like that tech enabled fast, fast booking cycle, then you might get caught out. There's a, there's a, a phrase that I, a saying that I really like, and it belongs to a much, a much smarter person than me, Warren Buffett, and it's to do with business and investment, but I, I like, I like it. So I, I'm, I'm going to use it because I think it holds true here. It's, it's, it's only when the tide goes out that you can tell who's been swimming naked. And that is why everybody needs a risk, a risk management strategy, because unfortunately too often, I, the first time I hear from a host or a property manager is when the worst has happened. And the worst could be the worst in their world. Um, but essentially, whatever it is that takes your property offline and puts it back into needing to be fixed and sorted means it's lost revenue for you. Also, if you're managing properties on behalf of other people, you lose a listing if you, if you get that listing trashed. And so then you're starting again, trying to find more owners and you've got the reputational loss to do. So it's, it's relevant to anybody. And, and I know this will come up further on, Matthew, in, in our discussion, but it is like, you know, and the reason why I say strategy is because it's got to come from you. If, you're, if your um, properties are by the sea, you'll have a specific type of risk um, you know, to, to do with the, the clients that want to come. If your properties are in a city centre, notorious for stag dues, hen dues, all that sort of stuff, football matches, you know, what happened, where do the Man United fans go after a, after a defeat to Liverpool, Pro probably to a, a vacation rental in the centre of Manchester, you have your own unique type of risk. So the strategy has to come from you. All right. So I think, you know, what I, I hear about a lot, it seems like in, in your world, there's really a major focus with Super Hog, but in two areas, guest screening and financial protection. Um, what's more important? Is one more important than the other, you know, between that guest screening and having some financial protection in place to, 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 to keep you protected? Yeah, it's that sort of chicken and egg thing, isn't it? I, I guess a, a little bit. But um, let's start with the assumption that everybody who's, who's putting their home or a home they're managing on the vacation rental market will have at least home insurance in place. Because clearly it would be very strange to have a property that's not at all protected with content or, or, or buildings cover. Um, if we can start at that assumption point, then really the first point, the, the most important thing is, is to vet and to screen. But, but let's go back a stage. Clearly, if you have no insurance in your property, like, you know, that's completely reckless. Like you need to have you need to have a, um, something in place in case a tree falls through, you know, or, or there's a flood, there's a fire, anything like that. So we start at that assumption. You've got a basic home insurance package. The, the, what I think more important is, is vetting people. And why? Because ultimately prevention is better than cure. Like don't allow your properties to be the place that people organize huge raving parties, sell tickets on, on Facebook and a thousand people turn up. Like all of that stuff 
is avoidable through the use of screening technology. We're going to go into this more, more, more later on. It's like going to the doctor and saying, hey, I've got, you know, the doctor diagnoses you with high blood pressure and they're going to give you some pills to treat that. They're also going to have a look at your lifestyle and say, what could you have been doing to, 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 to stop us getting to that point? And, you know, I think it's just a simple case of trying to be as proactive as possible. So I guess to answer your question, it's a tough one because they're both obviously so crucial. But I think it is the it's the screening technology. It's the, it's the prevention. So then let me ask you, right, because I know some hosts like instant book, right? We're going to have those simple things that are just there for Airbnb. What would you what would you say to those hosts, right? What are some of your recommendations to hosts that are putting off guest screening for fear that it's going to help their booking? You know, it's going to hurt their booking conversion. It's going to hurt the revenue that they're generating because, hey, I, I want to take more people than I'm declining. What, yeah. what words of wisdom do you have for them, Leo? Wisdom, that's a, that's a strong word for me, isn't it? He's putting me on the spot now. Um, I don't know. We're, we're quoting Buffett. We got some great quotes coming out here, Liz. You seem, you seem like one of those guys there, Leo. <laughs> you know I'm not. That's very mean. Now, um, the, uh, I'm, in terms of um, what I would say to them is, if you're using another type of screening tool, if you're using a screening tool and it is causing friction in your booking process, you're using the wrong one or you're, or it's being implemented in, in, in the wrong place in your journey or, or in the wrong way. Um, but first and foremost, if, if you're not using screening technology and you're worried about making the leap into doing it, then I would say, I guess I've answered that question separately by saying, just make sure you implement it in, in, the, in the correct way. And you think about what it is that you're trying to solve for, because I wouldn't recommend using any screening technology that screens a guest before they've booked and paid. So realistically, you want to collect the money from them first, and then you want to send them to the screen, either through a direct API or a PMS integration, you know, whatever it might be, however it's been being presented to you. But you want to send them to that journey. And then afterwards, they can, um, you know, go through it. But if it takes them three weeks to go through it, because their booking's not for another six weeks, you've not lost the you've not lost the booking, you've not put them off. And as long as you kind of make them aware of it in your on your listings and in your emails, you can do it in a way that controls the narrative, which is that, look, we really need you to do this because our hosts, for example, want to want to be sure that you're not criminal, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's ways, there's messaging you can do. Like we need to verify your identity before we can give you the key. So if you can kind of get that part done, perfect. Another thing I would recommend doing is link it to another thing you want them to do, like sign your rental agreement. That's good. So, so go, take, I'm going to take on this landing page to verify you and sign our rental agreement. You can also use that to be the place where you collect your deposits. And then there's a reason. There's a there's a there's a kind of there's a reason for that guest to be on there and doing that and doing that work for you without it just being about what's their identity and 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 and, and do you not trust me? So I guess what I would say is that anyone who is slightly put off from doing it. Um, Again, it's going back to this, you know, it's, it's the risk that you're exposing yourself to, but you do have to be very careful because all we're saying is have some, have some training wheels in place to make sure you can get comfortable about who this person is. There's an old Russian proverb, which I like, which is that um, trust, but verify. And that's really, really important. If you think about that, it's really important. It's like, it's not saying I don't trust you. And if a guest gets a whiff that you don't trust them, that will put them off. It's about saying, you know, thank you for making this booking. We're really looking forward to hosting you. This is a step we need you to go through before you arrive. And if you work with that and you build out that risk management strategy, then, then it's, you, you, you won't see an effect on your booking because also the bookings that will be put off coming to you are the party bookings, are the bookings where somebody's coming with criminal intent their intention is to book it, deal drugs. Their intention is to turn it into a, 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 a brothel, um, a mobile brothel for, for two weeks and, and make a lot of money and leave. All that stuff happens. And th those elements will, will not go and book a home where you're using screening technology because they know they're going to flag and they're going to end up in trouble. So I actually, I booked an Airbnb today down in Tumar, right? I'm going to go hang out in downtown for a little bit and enjoy some of the, enjoy some of the fruits of the local town that we have here instead of being in a village in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. A, this was the first time in years where I had to do some guest screening. Uh, mm -hmm. So I made the booking, you know, they had a, a message that came like 30 minutes or so later, probably could have used hospitable and got that right away when I was still on Airbnb, but that's neither here nor there. But they had a link to go ahead and fill out the form. I yeah. went through, it was pretty seamless. It already had some of my information that was put in. I had no problem doing it and uploading my ID for them. I didn't even think twice about it. And it wasn't mentioned anywhere. It wasn't discussed anywhere. Like I just went through it because I'm probably a stand-up person. I want to ask you in your opinion, 
where does that friction start to come in? Like, I've seen some things that are like, wow, I feel like I, a urine sample is going to be collected before I walk in there as well. <laughs> Have, what are some of the things that you've seen in other tools and other strategies that are off-putting, that are making people increase, you know, provide more friction and having it, you know, be a struggle for the guest experience? Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really good question. And again, clearly there's, clearly there's a lot of ways you can execute on this. So there's, there's, there's better and better and worse ways of doing it. But I think for me, it's, it's blurring, blurring in terms of what you're asking someone for. So if you're just asking them for like unnecessary levels of information, and they feel like they're, they're jumping through hoops for you without there being a purpose that's going to annoy people and that when people start to get annoyed by that that they're going to start to like notice how long it's taking and and, and notice that they have to go and get their passport and notice that you're asking them for their credit card you know so it, it's 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 doing enough to make sure you're comfortable but it's making sure that you're not saying to someone what's the purpose of your trip and who else you know who else are you traveling with why have you chosen to stay here like you know if you want to get that marketing information from them go and get that at, at, a, at another point this should be focused on the need that, that you have at that point another thing you can do is have a think about whether you actually need to biometrically screen guests because that's one of the things that is quite common in the industry is um they'll offer you uh, they'll offer the, the idea that they can I, id verify against someone's passport and their selfie and cross-reference the two great great bit of technology but do you need that or do you just need a background screen doing because maybe your guests are going to be particularly sensitive to having their having having to go and get their passport and do their do their selfie i find that if you're booking so if your bookings are like within your country if you're not taking overseas visitors it's very unlikely that your guests will have their passport to hand while they're while they're doing the booking process so, so that's just something to think about as well yeah and um you know with that said right so lots of things can go wrong with a reservation what are some of the common types of damage and issues that you see, you know, with short-term rental reservations in your experience in the industry thus far? Um, I'm that guy, aren't I? I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the guy with the stories, uh, and, and unfortunately. And, and no, I mean, that, it, it's interesting. I, I get asked this question in a, in a couple of different ways. It's one is, what's the most typical? And the other is, what's, what's the worst? Um, uh, or what's I, the weirdest, right? What's the most yeah, odd what's, thing you've had to go? Yeah, what's the weirdest? Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, uh, the... And I guess the, 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 the typical is quite mundane. It's very sort of regular types of damage that you would expect. So I think that there's an elevated, it's fair to say there's an elevated amount of risk um, during a booking if someone is using the property for the first time. And because they're on holiday, they also are not going to take the time to read manuals extensively. Like who, who does? Like you get there, key doesn't work. So you start like, you know, really not, I'm not saying I do this by the way, but you know, the key doesn't work. So you start, like really kind of like pulling up. The so one of the most common things we see is like door handles being ripped off and doors being like, because people are just impatient. Like, oh God, I'm trying this thing. It's just not working. It, it must be broken. Of course it isn't broken. It's a user error. So that's the thing I would say. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's very mundane things. It's sort of, um, I burnt a kitchen work surface with a pan while I was cooking because I didn't realize that in my kitchen at home, I can put it down because it's marble, but here it was wood and you can't put it down. So it's, it's, it's things like that. It's, um, it's red wine spillages because, I mean, I, I think, I don't know, but put it in the chat, guys, if, if you think this is too uh, authoritarian. But should we just ban people drinking red wine during, during bookings? I mean, could you say, like, you know, drink your wine at the pub, but if it's at home, it's got to be white or it's got to be fizzy? I mean, I don't know. Uh, that would not fly here in Portugal. I would have to <laughs> abruptly reject that reservation and say, well, I, I've been to places where they've left me bottles of port wine. And I'm like, oh, muito obrigado. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, maybe, so Maybe it's me. Maybe I, I, I am, you know, if, if I'm allowed to, if I get a night off from being a dad, I'm, I'm a bit of a white wine fiend. Maybe it's just me. But um, I think, and let's talk about the fact as well, that people travel with children. So I, I just traveled. Um, I went to Lille in Northwest France and had an amazing time at a, a vacation rental. but. Uh, we scraped the floor because we were kind of messing with the beds to get them the setup best for us and our daughter because we co-sleep. So we were we kind of moved it and we scraped the floor and I was like, bloody hell, so annoying. And 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 of course I um uh, I you know because I'm in the industry, I spoke to the host and and you know they're, they're going to send us a bill, right? And we're going to have to we're going to have to pay for it. So you know that that's the really mundane stuff. The worst stuff is is often why people come to us. And I don't need to go too much because I don't want to sort of spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt amongst you all, but floods so people leaving a bath running uh, and it happens to be at the top floor and it cascades down the floors and you have the carpets to replace throughout the house you know fires in kitchens because people leave ovens on and 
and pan smoke and and then the really terrible stuff which is like the which is the facebook invite parties that happen and you know in my one fine stay days we wouldn't have too many because you know it was we did our due diligence as much as we could but you know, we weren't using screening and uh, you know a couple of times a year you'd have big parties halloween new year's eve we all know these nights they're they're they're, they're, they're dreadful and you know the, the the damage associated with them is real and then that if you're managing on behalf of someone else they will delist if it's your own property you'll feel completely terrified to open it up again and and, and host and then you know, the one I mentioned, but it, it, it's real, is, is people doing criminal things in properties. So taking them over, dealing drugs, mobile brothels, shooting pornos, like it, it all happens, like, you know, and, and without tools in place, it, it, it can happen. Absolutely. And and having those tools in place, it's something that, you know, I've, I've spoken to a few property managers and it's, it's something that can help you earn more properties and differentiate as well, right? When you have this solid guest screening process in place, when you have some additional financial protections in place, owners are just going to be that much more comfortable with you. Hey, I know this person knows what they're doing. They're going to go through these steps and, and you're going to be able to pick up a couple extra properties that the other guy may not just because you have a process in place that makes them trust in you and makes them really feel that, okay, my home is in good hands. It's going to be taken care of if anything happens, but we know it's probably not even going to get to that point. Um, I think that's so right. I think that's right. Just to comment on that. And I think we could insert where we've talked about risk management strategies. We could also insert marketing strategies. Absolutely. And, and, and you, you're right. You're right. You're right to jump on that. And it's about, about like, I find that, that hosts, again, with my one price day hat on, because I remember my first job, I was in sales and I was door to door getting properties signed up in London. And people would always say, how do you vet the guests that are coming? They would always say that, like, well, where yep. are you getting the guests from? And it's, it's an awkward question if you don't have a strategy behind how you, how you vet. Yeah. And, and to, to sit and stand on another soapbox here as well, just for our industry in general, right? Doing a few extra things to make sure that we're, we're trying to make it so those bad actors really have less space to operate in. That's only going to help our industry. That's only going to help your neighborhood. That's only going to help your, you know, at the next local council meeting where they're talking about what happened at that house down the road, adding these additional practices, you know, they're not only good for you, for your marketing, they're also great for our industry overall. Um, again, so, so true. And I just want to, I want to add, add to that point and say, if we can stop people thinking it's the, the place you go for an after party and the place you go to book, then it will move on and it will, it will, it, the trend will, will, will begin to pass because again, this hasn't always been the case. So I completely agree. Like action is, is, is the best way to, to deal with these problems. I sit on the board in the UK and it's constantly what we get from policymakers is what it's, you know, it's just parties, yeah. isn't it? you have to try and, and fight the case that it's not because let's be honest, guys, 99% of them are not. It's it, yeah. a good bookings and that's what we want to focus on. 99.99 .99 at that point, right? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's jump into financial protection because again, you know, something like, okay, I have house insurance. We're good. Right. Um, what types of insurance options exist for hosts today? Do you see hosts taking advantage of and that you would recommend and suggest to hosts? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. In truth, you know, the, the, there's many different ways you can go with it now. I think first and foremost, you can have your standard home insurance policy, but make sure that your home insurance provider knows that you are um, uh, putting the home on the short term rental markets. So they know that you're doing it. Um, and if they know you're doing it, then you can check the provisions within it, mean that you're not going to, um, if they have an issue, if somebody falls over and injures themselves, because liability is the big is the big one, right? That's, that, 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 that's the sort of important wow. one when it comes to insurance. Clearly, contents and buildings is too. You want to know that if it burns down, you're protected too. So you could just start with your own home insurance provider. Probably that's probably the best place to start. You could also purchase a um, a, a short term rental focused home insurance policy. These are these have their roots in. Um, uh, I'm sure. I, I actually, to be honest, I'm going to be really honest. I, I don't know quite who the main operators are in the US, but I know in the UK there's people that've been doing it for like 50, 60 years because cottage holidays and the ones I mentioned going on as a young person, they would have all had to have a short-term rental home insurance. Now that, that owner may have been using the property themselves, or they may not have been, but they probably used it through the winter. They, it, that would cover everything. So that would cover their own use. That would also cover the, the short-term rental activity they were doing. You could also look to go down the route of having your own personal home insurance with a product on top, which covers you specifically for the risks that happen while a guest is in stay. So to make that different differentiation, you have home insurance, which protects you against a tree falling through um, in, 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 a, in a storm, and then a, a overlay short-term rental protection on top of that that protects you in case a your guest chops down that tree and it, and it, and it falls into the house. So it's very much focused on, 
on, on, on guest actions. And I, I've seen it work in, in, in a number of different ways. It, it, it's just essential you have something in the background because clearly who wants to lose that? And also another thing to be really careful about is you've got to tell your, um, you've got to talk to your mortgage provider, right? You know, you need to make sure that, that everyone's on board, everybody knows about it because the last thing you want is people to start the insurance company saying, I'm not going to pay because you didn't tell this person, this person, this person. So take it seriously and take some time over it. Obviously, I'm I'm someone you could talk to if you could bear to spend five minutes with me at any point. I'm, ha I'm happy to run you through it. The, the, the options are numerous. And again, like your risk management strategy, it will be completely dependent on where you are in the world and what type of homes you manage. Absolutely. If you own those homes, if you're managing them for others. So, um, you know, one thing we can talk about here as well as we've talked about bad actors and, and property damage, things like that. But there are also different types of frauds that we're trying to prevent and to manage uh, within our industry. How does super hog screening combat some of the different types of fraud that we're seeing out there in today's day and age? Yeah, it's it, it's right back to what we said at the start. It's, it's getting one step ahead of the criminals because things are always changing, right? Things are always, always, always evolving. And, and fraud splits out in, 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 in my world, anyway, into two different things. One is sort of um, genuine fraud and the other is friendly fraud. Um, often it's quite hard to tell what's friendly fraud versus what's genuine fraud. And that and, and that's why it's that's why it's really interesting because I think I think we'd all agree that people are able to do chargebacks probably too easily with their credit card companies. It's it's a it's a broken system. I actually read an article. I, I must have. I, I'll, I'll try and find it. I'll, I'll put it. I'll ping it to this group. But I read a really interesting article on it. And it's clearly a credit card company wants to show that they've got their interest of their consumer and that they're, and they've got their back and all that sort of stuff. But it does lead to, as we all know, like people kind of not 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 really playing the game with it. I'll, I'll go on to that though. Let, let's start with the like the, the fairly standard stuff. So somebody's had their um, identity. Um, someone is using someone else's identity to go through the, the booking and they've, and they've got their, their, that person's credit card and they know a little bit about them. When they hit something like ID verification screening, which is a part of what we do and other companies, um, our software will, ID, will, will, will pick up whether it is indeed the person they've said it is because they'll have to put their passport and then the selfie and then we'll cross-reference the two. So at that point, when you look back on the booking, um, you know, you can prove if someone claims that their credit card was stolen, you can say, well, look, it wasn't because this is you. So actually, you know, this is this is genuine fraud that you're trying to commit. Or if someone's using a stolen credit card, and they are actually using a stolen credit card. It will stop them going to that step and they'll cancel the booking or they won't make the booking because they won't they, because they won't want to go to it. So the stolen credit card one is it, it, it is linked to the identity theft one. But what I would suggest you do more than anything is use 3D Secure wherever you can. When you're taking a booking, we use it. So we, we run credit cards when we take deposits and deposit waivers for our clients, which I'm sure we'll get on to talking about later. Um, but so when we do, when we do our deposit management process for our clients, we always run those cards through 3D Secure because then it goes back to their bank and they have to verify that it is indeed them using facial recognition on their banking app or using a code. And that's the best way to ensure that it isn't, it isn't a stolen credit card. So stolen, stolen identity screening, stolen credit card, 3DS, and also the two link, because if you're using a stolen credit card, when you come into the ID screening part of what we do, again, you, your names won't match and we'll be able to, to be able to pull it up that way. Guests claiming credit cards have been stolen. Interesting, that's where it starts to blur, as we've said. We should be able to catch that with, 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 with all the biometric stuff we do. Another reason why people might, might do what we call friendly fraud is they'll, they'll claim that uh, they'll, they'll cancel their booking before they arrive and claim that your cancellation policy wasn't read or is unfair. And then that the, the bank will recharge, will, will reimburse them. I'm sure this has happened to some of you in this group. It, it must have done because it's so common. Um, this one, there is no absolute certainty to avoid friendly fraud that's the problem with it but you can put tools in place to really really reduce it or make sure you're ahead of what the latest le legislation is around it and that's what we do at superhog so at the moment my, my my piece of advice is have your rental agreement inserted into that journey and have them tick it and have your cancellation policy in big bold letters right next to where they tick it not just like hidden away on page 15 but like page one like these are the cancellation terms. If you book out, if you cancel outside of these cancellation terms, you will not be entitled to a refund or you will be entitled to a refund, but 50% of no. Lay that out. And what we're working on at the moment is, this is a bit of a side, is we're working on a bit of technology to, to, to 
also have it that the, the document is e-signed, not just ticked, but e-signed. So in that world, you can then put the e-signature right next to where it talks about the cancellation policy. And that's the best way to fight a chargeback um, when it comes to cancellation. And then the, the toughest one is, is someone saying that the service you've delivered them is, is, is not up to scratch. Um, and clearly, you know, we put together this screening technology in the hope that, um, uh, you know, we, in the hope that if that does happen, you can, none of the other things should happen that I've mentioned, right? But if you get the service failure one, you're kind of outside of the super hog remit at that point, but, or the screening remit, should I say, but I would just say this, the most important thing to do is document everything that happens, like screenshot, screenshot things on Airbnb, email addresses, think about your email addresses the whole way. So you're, so you're talking about like, you know, um, if you solve a problem for them, if you forgot the towels and you deliver them, just to check, is there anything else we can do? Um, we've now delivered the towels, has that solved it? You know, whatever it is, just kind of go over the top, over the top, because then you can obviously present that as evidence to it, to a credit card company. It's a shame you have to think like that, but you do. You kind of have to act like someone's marking your homework the whole time and it's frustrating, but it's, it's kind of the way. So I, I, I hope I haven't bored on too much about that, but I think that kind of, that explains the split. There's there's fraud, there's genuine fraud, and then there's people somewhere a bit, you know, chancing yeah. their arm, I suppose, so to speak. No, absolutely, absolutely. That makes a, a ton of sense there. And that's why, you know, with Hospitable, one of the tools, like, send that first morning message. Send the check-in message afterwards, double-checking. Yeah. So in the first morning, hey, how's everything going this far? When they reply back, yeah, everything's great. Unfortunately, you could use that as a bit of evidence to present your case, right? Or then at the end, when you're asking for that review, what did you think? If you had any feedback and they're sharing that information with you, it's always great to be checking in with those guests as they're going through the process, especially early on, because if they are having a bad experience, then you have an opportunity to correct it. You have an opportunity to make that right. So when they say that, you know, hey, we're having a problem with ABC, you can address it right then and there. And then for the rest of their stay, they're not going to have any issues and you're going to reduce that potential impact that could have happened if you weren't paying attention and just letting things happen in the background. Um, so we talked about, you know, different ways we we're talking about fraud, some of the different pieces that are there. I feel like, I mean, if anybody asked me for my card or for my, any of my identifications, like that's a stop for me. Like you just need to ask for that. And I'm not going to cause any problem because you know who I am, you know, where I'm, you know, where you can find me. Right. Um, so what information is helpful when you're fighting fraud and pulling that information in from a guest and, you know, have you seen instances where it's just way too much and there's really no need for ABC? And if any of those things, you know, stand out to you that, hey, you probably don't need and could remove from your process. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think, I think, again, this goes back to tailoring your strategy based on the type of bookings you've done. Like maybe you've done a thousand bookings and, and you really understand that two of them have been friendly fraud chargebacks that you've been able to dispute with the bank and you've been able to you've been able to win those disputes. If that's your world and you don't have a lot of like um, people trying to pretend to be someone else, you probably don't need to put the ID and the selfie screening um, on there because it could be more of a barrier to your booking flow than, 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 than a useful a useful thing when it comes to fight, fighting fraud. The most important thing is making sure that you're using something like 3D Secure. Like yes, in your screening tool, if you if you're if you're plugging in credit card details at any point in it, but just in your booking process, and that's the overwhelming thing. Three D secure, secure, use it for sure. And again, if if fraud is a problem for you, you absolutely one hundred percent should be using a screening technology. The screening technology will be what, um, without any shadow of a doubt, makes it categorical that it was that person who was there taking the booking. Quite a lot of the, the checks that we do, though, are a bit more um, behind the scenes. So when someone goes through our system, we can check the IP address. So we can check whether that IP address is one that is uh, flagged as being used for fraudulent activity, whether it's a proxy, whether it's hidden, or whether it's a genuine IP, and whether the IP looks like it's in a place in the world that would make sense where the booking is being made. So, so, so important. The other thing we do is we do screening on their mobile phone and their email address. And really, this is the crux of, of I, I think, how you can get ahead of, because really what you want is you just want these fraudulent bookings to be flagged so that they don't even make, so the booking never happens, right? So you don't end up in a chargeback dispute, you know, three months, four months later, you, you spot them straight away and you can cancel the booking. So you should be using technology that, and it exists. It's here. You know, I'm telling you, it's here. The, the mobile phone number, can you can see who, we can see 
who it's registered to. So if it's not registered to the name of the guest who's booking, that's a flag. Because why is it unregistered? That implies it's a burner phone, which implies drug dealers, which implies party goers, criminal activity. Also, is that mobile phone linked to the email address? So are, are there any other passwords online where they've, where they've linked that email and that phone number for a, another social media or a login that they've done? What's the sentiment on that social media? Does it look genuine? Is the email address new? Has it just been started five minutes ago to get through the verification? Or is it two or three years old and has social media attached to it? That is super important. Like that, that really is the, the, the nuts and bolts of this because what a lot of people do is in a fraudulent case, they'll go online, they'll find an email and a phone number that match one another and then they'll try and put those in the system. Our system can read all that and we can see, okay, they're pulling that from this website. They're, they're, they're trying to match these two pieces of evidence together. It's, sorry, these two pieces of information together and this is an anomaly. Let's raise a flag and let's, and let's recommend that the booking gets cancelled. And it's better safe than sorry and it's going to stop you getting into those disputes three, four months down the line. And I'm assuming that the host is going to have access to all this. So in case we do go through this, things go well, but there's an issue of a chargeback. Like we could present these things that you're doing in Superhog as evidence to show that it was a legitimate transaction or whatever it may be, correct? Yeah, correct. If they were working with us, you get a guest data report on every guest that, that's, that, that's gone through and the, and the yes or no, you know, the, the score, yeah. whether you should set the booking or not. Yeah, that's one. I've, I've, I fight the chargebacks here at Hospitable. And, and one that just came up recently was like, hey, you can provide the IP address to show that they've been accessing your pro your product. And it's like, ah, great. We do have that information. I can show you when it was the last accessed. Hopefully, we're going to win that case. But mm -hmm. it's tough out there. We I, I also learned on one of these town halls recently, on our town hall that we had, where the bank will always grant the first chargeback from somebody. So the first chargeback claim that you put in, the bank is going to file it in your favor regardless because it's your absolute first so that they can show again that they're supporting their consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So in those cases, there's almost you know nothing that you can really do there. Fight your case and maybe take it on if you need to, if it's that big of a, a, of a hit to you. Um, all right. We went, I think we, we, just before we, we wrap yeah. that, I think we, we touched on this earlier when we were talking about prevention and trying to improve the reputation of the industry. It, it also works in this issue of fraud as well. Like, We'll start winning more more fraud chargeback cases. The more evidence wow. we can admit as an industry, and the more that people will realise that it, you know, because banks and you know they, they're going to learn, aren't they? And we can help that education, right? We can push that education in their faces with the with the with the evidence that we have, and hopefully that then that cleans it up because it's it is a massive problem, as we all know. It's such a massive and it's so so painful. And and but we're we're on the front line with with other people in working slightly different corners, with trying to make sure that everyone has the, the necessary information and, and I learn, I love it when I speak to someone and they tell me something new, but uh, yeah. you know, what I'm hearing at the moment is it's not enough to have a cancellation policy on page 15, but you have to have it on page one in block capital in bold so that, so they can't claim they missed it. So they can't see that. Okay. That's great. That's awesome. So put it out there really quickly in that, in that, in that guide. All right. Damage deposits, right? Everybody loves having the damage deposit. It feels good. Airbnb is making that changes. So um, what's your view? We know some OTAs want to dissuade hosts, right? They're taking it off platform. They're making you do it elsewhere from taking them. Talk to me a little bit about damage deposits. Like I said, I can already hear Pierre going off wherever it is, holding his baby, putting her to sleep right now about uh -huh. damage deposits. Yeah, well, firstly, I, I disagree with the OTAs when they try and dissuade you from 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 taking to, for, for protecting yourself. But there has to be better, smarter ways of doing it, ultimately. So, you know, the OTA's focus generally is on, is on the booking. It's not on the delivery of said booking. Um, that not sort of casting dispersions on the OTA world, but it's just, it, you know, it, it stands to reason. You're there to take a commission, to take your booking. The more of them you take, the, the more successful your, your business is. It's not really to get into the nitty gritty of delivering service. We know vacation rental industry is not OTA's. It's not just OTA's. It is the people behind curating the listings delivering the towels, creating a business that's all about hospitality and service. It's, it's fantastic. It's like, you know, I'm addicted. Like, you know, when I, when I, when I first stayed in that place in Devon, there was, there, 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 was, there was no OTA and there was no need for a damage deposit because there we were handing over the keys and, and two weeks later, if we'd, we'd have broken anything, we'd have paid for it. Um, but you do need to have a provision for small damages because after most bookings, you could probably go around and find a very small bit of damage or not be quite sure where, where the damage has come from. So you want to do something that's hopefully going to stop stop um, creating barriers for, for guests. And I think, the, I think the smartest way to do that is to have a mixture of, I would like to suggest that people should give the guests the option between 
a traditional deposit or a damage waiver? And I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail in, 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 as, to, as to what I mean by that. But let me say this straight away. Having an insurance policy for small damages is, is, is not the answer. Is not the answer because it, you can't, when you get onto the small damages, it's very hard to say exactly what's happened, when it happened, and you have to be really good to have caught it when you come to clean up the property, exactly which booking the small bits of damage have happened. They just accumulate. You know, back in when, when last week when I was in Lille, we hadn't told the property manager about the scratch on the floor. Maybe he wouldn't have found it for three more bookings, but still someone would have been on the hook. So it's really, really important to remember that, that like insurance is not the answer for, for under, for, for very, very small stuff. So it, 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 it's complicated. Deposits are good, but again, you need to be able to attribute it to one particular booking. And you then are in an argument with your, your, your guest about whether they indeed did cause that damage. So it's, it's complicated. The damage waiver, though, I think might just be the best of all roads. Now, again, I recommend you give the guest the option between the two, but some clients just use the waiver because it's, it's, it's so straightforward, which is that you charge someone a non-refundable fee of, say, $35. That $35 gives them an accidental damage guarantee up to $500, which means as a host, you won't chase them if they break something accidentally. What you're doing there is you're self-insuring. You're basically saying, we know that if we charge 35 bucks per reservation for small damages, we'll, we'll win more than we lose and we'll always have money to pay for the damage when we find it. So that's your money, you know, like, and if you work with someone like us, we'd remit that to you minus a small handling fee. And you would have it in an escrow account ready so that if, you, if, if and when damage comes along, you can pay for it. So even if it isn't attributable to that particular booking, it's a scratch on the floor when someone was moving a bed and it's 200 pounds because you've got to get it re-sanded and, and varnished. Cool. You have, the, you have the money in there ready to go. And you build up that slush fund for yourself to make sure that you're always on the front foot when it comes to uh, paying for those small damages. It means if you're managing properties on behalf of other, other people, you're never going to have that awkward conversation with, with the owner because you're always able to say, look, it's fine. I can see what's happened. I think it's probably wear and tear, but let's just pay it anyway. And if they're your own properties that you're managing or you've just got a couple, it just means you've got money to pay for that remedial work that needs to happen because of the wear and tear and the small damages that occur. Um, and it moves you out of that line of should I take a, you know, should I, should I be at the mercy of the OTA? Should I push back and take a deposit? But if you are to give people the option between traditional deposit and waiver, which, which is good, you know, get people like choice, 85% of the time, our, our research would suggest 85% of the time they'll choose the waiver. Why? Because who needs the hassle of 500 pounds coming out of their bank account? Someone's going to say, great, I'll just pay the waiver fee. And they'll forget they've even paid it by the time they arrive. But, but it's there. You know, someone that travels with a child, I'll always pay the waiver because I know what's possible. If I take my eyes off Sadie for five minutes, you know, she might be drawing on something or, you know, moving something. And, and, and so I, I would definitely pay that. Whereas if you tell me, look, you've got to have 500 pounds on, on your credit card for, for two months, you know, I, I might think twi twice about it. So I guess my overarching thing is give choice do something and probably you'll end up, I think probably the, the best of all roads is, is to have some sort of waiver scheme. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that, educating us a bit on how that works. Um, I'm sure hosts are going to have some questions there. I'm going to go ahead and take a few questions from the audience here, Leo. We got about 15 minutes left and we got some good ones here. Cool. Um, so one of the questions that they had, and this is something that I hear all the time and people are, are just trying to kind of figure out what's going on. And this is something we've spoken of overall, but when renting out through Airbnb and Verbo, how can I protect myself if someone damages that property? Are there things on the platform that can be done for me? Because a lot of hosts think they can just rely on that. And I'm sure you may have a word or two about that with the property, with the, the platforms managing that. But, you know, they see hosts requiring a rental agreement, damage waiver, um, you know, standard protection, because so the standard protection may not cover those. Well, how do you feel about relying on the OTAs? Like, what is your experience with the OTAs and helping you out when issues come up? Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I guess it's a good rule for life, isn't it? That you don't want to be reliant on someone else's is, is process because then you're at the mercy of it. You always want to be proactive, pro, proactive and have taken control. So it, I, I would be, the, the, the different OTAs do a, do a different amount of due diligence for you, right? In the, in the, in the mm -hmm. prevention stage. And they also do a different amount for you when it comes to the cure. Uh, and I hear that it's wildly inconsistent whether you get paid out or whether you don't. So I would just say because of that inconsistency, my thought would always be take control, have my own risk management strategies and processes in place um, that, that, that are linked to my business directly. So that I guess the good way to answer that is if you have your own protection, so it could be financial protection, could be insurance in the more traditional sense, 
you have the liquidity of a very large business because you have that $5 million guarantee. You know, if you worked with Superhog and we overlay alongside our screening, you can also buy a $5 million guarantee from us um, to protect against guest actions. You've then suddenly got the liquidity of, of that big business because anything goes wrong, you're protected. Whereas if you're then just relying on the OTA, if they let you down, then you, there's nothing you can do about it. Understood. Yeah. And, you know, using a tool like SuperArg or some of those great tools that are out there are, are things that are going to help you. But understand what you need, right? Just like with anything else, like really understand what your needs are and what you're looking for, and then go and seek something to match that need. Don't just go out there because you think, hey, maybe this. What? Take a look within right? Let's get deep here. Take a look within, take a look at that business. What are some of the things we need to cover for? What are some of the issues that we're concerned about? And then go and seek that tool that's going to help you to make that happen. Um, yeah. Now, do you, I don't know if, if Superhog does this, but do you, do you have any way to identify guests who have been bad actors in the past? Or do you have anything to speak of some of the tools that do things like that? Um, you know, where people have thrown parties or have got kicked out or have, yeah. you know, had other challenges with, with any of the platforms. Does the Superhog offer anything like that? Yeah. So, I, I, as I've already kind of focused on, I, I think the real meat in, in what Superhog does specifically is this, is that if you want it, we can check the IDs and cross-reference them with a selfie. That, that, that's pretty meaty. But then more importantly is the IP, the email address, the phone number, and, and the home address as well, because we can do all that sort of online um, uh, scrolling to make sure that there's nothing in there that looks like an anomaly. But also alongside it, and again, it's not something that I, I highlight too often, but we've got the years of data that we have around things that have gone wrong in, in property. So yes, you benefit from, you will occasionally get a flag from Superbox saying, don't take this guest because of a previous incident in a previous booking. Now we, we won't share what's gone on because we will be very cautious about what we provide you information wise, but we'll just tell you, do not take the booking because of a previous incident. You know, but we have evidence that this person is booking you, you shouldn't take. And with us, it's never gray will tell you to take a booking if you should be and not take it if you shouldn't. So yes, there is that database element. The Superhog database is, is a powerful thing. But that said, there's clearly bookings going on all over the world that um, that, 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 that we're not managing and, and, and we don't know about. And as an industry, it's something we need to do. We need to come together and create that kind of environment where um, we're sharing information about, about bad actors. And that's one of the reasons I'm super passionate about what we're doing, what we're trying to do. We're trying to help property managers take back control. I remember speaking to a, company, um, a property management company in Wales. They had like five or six listings, they were new. And I told them about Superhog and they said, that's awesome. That's basically what we do collectively in our region. If someone tries to book and we think it's a stag do, we'll email everyone else and say, don't take this booking. Or if somebody like doesn't pay or does a fraud or break something, we'll, we'll message it around and, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk to you about it. So that is one of the kind of, um, you know, um, ideas of Superhog is that you can, yeah. you can create this collective where you can all remove the bad actors and make sure that people don't get caught out. Wonderful. Um, next one's coming here from Lindsay. So Lindsay, Lindsay says that we're currently managing 61 units. We're growing around five a month. Well done, Lindsay, way to go. Um, can we use Superhog to insure ourselves as opposed to having to involve Airbnb? So I do want to tag on to this as well. Like what's the ideal Superhog customer and who do you see using your service most successfully? Like what's that great customer for you because of the features that you offer? Um, a two-parter there that I added on. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, good question. You may you may have to um, remind me when I answer the first bit what what the second bit was. Sure, sure, we'll do. Um, so, yes, it's a, congratulations. It's sixty one properties. That's a uh, that's a that's a very typical level uh, size customer for us in in the US. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You you want to make sure that you have. I think you want to make sure you have the same level of protection, irrespective of, of the OTA you're using, whether you're taking direct booking. So. I think that the easiest way is to have a consistent screening and protection business behind what you're doing so that whether it's on your direct booking website or it's Airbnb or it's through a travel agent partner or it's a corporate that you might be rebooking because they, they want to come back. Every time the risk is slightly different, but the process should always be the same. Um, and they should, you know, you should know that they're going to go through your screening tool. And then at the other end of it, if anything does go wrong, you're protected by somebody like Superhog and the $5 million guarantee that, 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 that we have. Clearly, one of the things we will do, because you've got to remember as well that we're, we're present in that, in that check-in process. So the guests will know that they've given Superhog their, their information. And if, if they then have a riotous party, we'll contact them, we'll email them. Or if they've done something less 
serious, but they've damaged something and they've left the property without confessing to it, we'll email them and say, look, you need to pay for this because your host is now liable for it. So we're, 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 we get a we get 50% of the time, we actually get guests to pay for their own damage, which is remarkable, right? And then obviously there's the super guarantee that if you wanted to have that attached, you could use for the other 50% of the time that, that those incidents happen. But that's remarkable, right? 50% of the time we're able to get the guest to, to, to do the right thing because they've gone through that screening and they're worried that they're going to fall foul of it somewhere else and not be able to book. And I didn't touch on this, but it's one of the things I often say to people is, diff, you know, the same person can act very differently depending on the type of holiday they're on. Mm. So if they're away with their friends on a stag do, they might get carried away. And then they're worried that when they try and book something for their other half and their child, they might fall foul of the watch list. So, you know, you can get people to pay things back directly. And that's the best of all worlds because things get paid back quickly directly to the host. And so, you know, an OTA doesn't have that kind of pull. So that's another good reason why I think you would probably be right to have, have your, own, your own stuff in place. You just made me smile wholeheartedly because I'm thinking about my weekend trip where I'm going to go stay downtown. But all I really care about is if they have a bathtub because I want to take a bath uh, <laughs> as opposed to the trip that we're going to be taking in Vegas in a few months to VRMA. If anybody's <laughs> going to be there, please stop by the booth. We'd love to say hi to you. Yeah, Matt Matt Demetrio may be a bit different on that Vegas trip than he is. No, it's professional. We're going to be. <laughs> well, I don't know. I was talking to one of the organizers today and it, it sounds like there's a lot of focus on the uh, a lot of focus on the social uh, put into oh, in Sin City. How can we not? Um, <laughs> but my other question for you is what, you know, uh, you mentioned like 60 properties. That's right about, is there a, a, a best customer for you? Somebody who really is looking for this service? Like we know with hospitable people who are using, looking for a simple software that they can get up and running that day that aren't looking for something with all the bells and whistles that they don't need. They need something at the right price. Like those are the people that we work with, the people getting started, the people scaling, or even those people who want to use us as part of their tech stack and not as their tech their main tool as they get to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of properties. Do you have anything about that ideal customer that some of these folks listening may want to go take a look at Superhog if they fit the bill? Yeah. So it's, it, it's, I think you're right. I think, I think our ideal customer is probably your ideal customer as well, right? It's people who want to buy a solution off the shelf and they want it integrated with other bits of software they're using. Uh, so that's the point of, of, of hospitable and super hog integration as well, right? Is to make sure that it's all enabled and it's super simple. Um, or people that are at the scaling point who might want to uh, buy it off the shelf from us, but also hack bits of it to kind of bring it into their environment and, and change bits and bobs of it. So it's very pliable. And like I've always said to you, it's about ultimate, we're, we're, you can use our tool just for screening. So that means we just do the IP, the phone number, the email, the, the home address or you can use for screening and ID screening. And you, you can then start to building damage waivers, deposit handling, and and $5 million protection. So you can you can plug and play. So it's okay. definitely built for people that, that are scaling and their needs will change as they scale. But look, 80% of the industry is, is this, is this segment, right? This is this is the part, this is the part that um that, that is the backbone of the industry. Yeah. Is that's growing. So I got a question here from Cindy. Cindy, this is a good one. I appreciate it. I'm going to take a stab at this one and see how much you educated me. Please bear in mind, it's almost eight o'clock. It's been a long day here, but <laughs> I feel like even a background check aren't going to flag the guest that does a little damage, steals a few things, as you put it so, so gingerly there. My first guest did $700 in damage, blinds, chairs, seems like they even stole the Pyrex from her. Man, we love that Pyrex. Um, but it's not like they're going to have criminal records, right? Or, or there's the potential that they're not going to have those criminal records records so how does someone like that get flagged of course we're we're looking for the drug dealers the criminals but what about that little stuff so for me it seems like the flag is only a part of it the flag is to be able to prove that that person was there or that you know there's no fraudulent or if, if there's a chargeback claim or something along those lines like we've did, done our due diligence and hopefully by asking them to go through guest screening they may be a little bit more concerned about taking the Pyrex because you yeah. do have their information, et cetera. But then, okay, those things are going to happen even with guest screening, unfortunately. It seems like those other solutions where, where you have a damage deposit or, or a damage waiver where we've now had 300 guests come through at 35 bucks. Well, now we have that money that we can go pull to cover that damage for this specific one so we're not at a loss or some of those other insurance options because you mentioned that for some of the smaller things, going for insurance, like saying a Pyrex is stolen, isn't going to work, but some of the additional protections you cover, is there anything that I'm missing there as I, as I spit that back to you and, and see how well, uh, how well I learned here tonight? You learned super well. Um, I think, you, you know, you could, you could talk about super with more authority than, than me. After anyone hey. else. Come on, seriously. No, I know. I, no, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And, and yes, you, you've answered it correctly. Like it's, it's, it's about combining the, the idea of prevention, um, 
and protection. And I would say that the fundamentally, fundamentally most important thing is that most damage is, is a small amount and a manageable amount. Therefore, use a damage waiver. Why not? Like we, we can, we, Subar can take that for you and, and remit it to you. Sits in the bank account, ready for those small damages. But if the worst happens, yeah, have a five million dollar guarantee for, for the big stuff too. But you should be, you should see a great reduction in that type of activity because, again, as Matthew so elegantly, uh, eloquently put. It's, it will be reduced by the fact that they they don't want to fall foul or end up not being able to book somewhere else in the world where the client's using Superhog. So it will alter someone's behavior if they've gone through a tool like this. Plus, the, the more careless people, realistically, they might look at what you're doing. And if they were being like, yeah, we're here for a stag do, they'll, they'll just go and book elsewhere. Yeah. So that's more, that damage becomes more serious than the type of activity. And like I say, if I was going on a stag do and, and they said, oh, yeah, we, we just need you to do your passport and your selfie, I think I'd be a bit like, um, OK, well, yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah, can we just go and stay in a hotel? You know, it's, and, who knows? Who knows? But it's 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 just about making sure you have all, all your ducks in a row, and you're and you're doing what's right for you and your business. And again, know what you've got to tread that balance between creating a really ultimately positive guest experience and then getting the information you need. So that's where the curation comes in. And I'm really happy to jump on calls with people and talk about that because it's it's interesting to me. And I think there is different strategies that you can use in different yeah. types of booking scenarios. And I'm happy to help. That's that's phenomenal. So, um, Karen, another one from Karen Faulkner. You've been killing it here with these questions. Thank you. But before we get going here, do you recommend that all guest names need to be provided? Does Superhog do anything for the entire guest party? Because, you know, like today I had to give my ID, my information, but it didn't ask for anybody else that was coming through when I went through that guest screening. Um, you know, it doesn't seem like some tools would ask for that. Is is there anything there within Superhog or do you help with that and making sure that, hey, not only am I clean, but you know, my wife, maybe not the six and the three year old, we don't have any <laughs> problems except for crayon issues. But is there anything that that within your solution or things that you've seen that can help folks in those cases? I'm just thinking about how cute my daughter would look going through a, a biometric facial recognition thing. I think she'd, she'd, she'd look adorable. And I, Her I think passport. I bet that passport yeah. is something special, right? That's Honestly, sure. it is. I, it's a good job I don't have it to hand, or I'd be showing you my daughter's passport. It's, it's the cutest thing in the world. Um, the uh, yes is the answer. So, uh, so most people just have the lead guest because clearly, if you go away with your friends or your family, like you know, everyone's kind of in it together. It's rare that people would sort of be like, "Oh, I'm going to cause damage. I don't care." But yeah, yeah. And there is a there is a moment where it might be a big group booking, and you do want to put everyone through it just to estimate and take it more seriously. Yes, of course you can do that. So the normal process would be links get sent to verification requests get sent to a lead guest. However, on a case by case basis, you could you can also within the Superhog system create extra links and send them out to, to to the whole party and say, "Look, everybody needs to do this." And I want to see everybody's ID or I want to see everyone going through the basic screening before I say yes to this booking. Or um, one option is you could you could take a, if you wanted to, and this is all, all possible, you could take a, a small security deposit from everyone or yeah. a deposit, damage waiver from everyone. And that and that, that might not be a, a bad way of doing it. Absolutely. Okay. That's great. And and we're just about wrapping up here time. Before I let you go, I know your marketing team. I'm going to help them out. They asked something about what was it, ebook, freaky, what was, what was the ebook that we need to drop? Thank God you okay. remembered that, Matthew. Yeah. So yeah, sorry. We, we, there's an ebook we've done all about short-term rental uh, fraud and um, things that we've encountered and learnings that we've had over the years that that, that that we've been doing this. We are very very passionate about what we do, and I th I'm sure that will come across in the ebook. It, it's really worth a read. But we, we see ourselves as hopefully having some useful insights to share around this topic, and it'll be a lot of what we've covered tonight, but but a more in-depth look well about about problems that that can occur can occur. And ways to overcome them so well reminded or i would have got in serious trouble for not yeah so and that's something that we can include in the email that we're going to send out to us afterwards right where they'd be able to go ahead and access that in some yeah, way and I'll from put it in the chat as well i'll put it awesome in the chat. Put a link. and and we do just so you all know i i saw it a few times there we do have plans on integrating with super hog we we are going to be adding them to a system for the direct booking capabilities and sometime in the near future the ability to to, to add this to all reservations regardless of the ota um so, you know, looks like our time's come to an end today. Thank you so much, Leo. This was awesome. You know, thank you for leading this amazing masterclass. You shared some great insights. I know I learned and proofs in the pudding. Uh, and I know definitely some folks, they may have some more questions, but at least they're going to be more educated questions at this point, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, most importantly, thank you all so very much for joining us and being such an active audience. Thanks for, you know, hitting up the chat, sending those Q&A questions our way. Uh, again, we know you're walking out of here with some great knowledge. Uh, here at Hospitable, you know, we love helping co-stream 
streamline their business while generating income, um, generating more revenue for their bookings. If you're not a hospitable host yet, you can check it on our website. Get started with a 14 day free trial. You, you can get up and running today. You can connect your Airbnb account, start automating messages, syncing your calendar across bookings in minutes. You can do it probably before you finish a cocktail. We're going to be putting that to the test when we go to Vegas. So come stop by the booth there. Um, Simone is going to share a free trial link, I believe in the comments, or you'll also get that in the follow-up email that we're sending tomorrow. Um, and you know, lastly, if you enjoyed what the content we had today, join us next month, we're going to have a hospitable host workshop where we actually have four of our own hosts with all varying levels of experience. They're going to share their stories on how they deal with declines and inquiries, declines with bookings and you know booking cancellations overall they're going to share some great information for you all based on their own based on their own history the things that they've been through so be sure to join us next month september 29th 11 a.m pacific time we got to start getting these a bit later for you pacific folks don't worry we're, we're, we're listening to you um that's all from me thank you so much leo we appreciate having thanks. you that's what i wanted to say thanks it's been it's been really really cool uh, if you ever want to have me back then i'm sure we can find someone more interesting from the business than me to do it to do a much better one but i think it's great that you guys do this i love the focus on community i'm a real vacation rental geek just like matthew is and you know love talking about this sort of stuff so please i put my email on there as well you know let let, let me know if you want to have a video call and, and and i can i can talk you through what what we've learned while we've been on this journey so Nice That's to meet wonderful. You. We appreciate that all, man. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. Well, you know, we're over here in Portugal. It's time to go put the girls to bed, as I love to say at the end of these and go spend a, a little bit extra time with them. Thanks again, Leo. Thanks for joining us all once again. Have a great rest of your day, your evening, night, morning, whatever it may be all over the world. Thank you so much. Ciao, ciao, everybody. Thank you.